Standing by the Terry and Ted podcast is sponsored by Jaguar Land Rover Laval. Get out of the big city and experience a construction zone free test drive. There is such a thing. Hi, Ted Bird. This is very exciting. Yes, I'm excited. That's it? Yeah. That's all you got? Yeah. It's a low-key excitement. <laughs> it's an inside Yeah, Yes, that's excitement. right. Yeah. That yeah. I'm pacing okay. myself. All right. Very good. We, uh, we have a very, very special guest who's uh, going to join us here in a second. And as usual, as we've said this whole season, Ted and I are getting used to being like a couple of rude arseholes. There's a person at the table, and we don't acknowledge them because first we want to say thanks to our title sponsor... And it's not because we're being rude. It's because uh, that's just the way she goes. Got to take care of business. And, <laughs> and thank you. Jaguar Land Rover Laval. I had to take the courtesy vehicle back this morning, the uh, Jaguar F-Pace 25T. It was sad. It was sad. I was quite sad. I did, uh, I must say, uh, to my own credit, I filled it up with premium gas before I took it back. That's good manners. Yeah. Those are good manners. I didn't get it washed, though. And mm-hmm. I told them, well, it rained yesterday, so it got a good rinse. Okay, cool. <laughs> It's a beautiful vehicle, and I miss it already because uh, we're just moving into summer, and the air conditioning's broken in my car. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So, uh, yeah, one of these days I wouldn't mind uh, getting one of those and uh, just hanging on to it for good, a Jaguar or a Land Rover, beautiful vehicles. As we've said many times, uh, half the deal, at least up there, is the family, the Decubellis family, Nino and Renato. Uh, not only do they sell spectacular products, you get spectacular service from them, family-oriented, customer-centric service. Yes, it's a luxury car brand, but uh, they're not highfalutin. You don't have to be dripping in finery to get their attention. Look at us. Mm -hmm. We went in today and they went, how are you? (laughs) (laughs) JaguarLaval.ca and LandRoverLaval.ca. If you're in the market for uh, a luxury brand vehicle, don't buy anything until you go see them. One of the most popular stand-up comedians in all the country, one of the most popular stand-up comedians in the province, uh, one of the most popular people on the interweb. One of the most listened-to podcasters. Yes. Is uh, Sugar Sammy here? <laughs> <laughs> Is Sugar Sammy's coming in? It's Mike Ward. <laughs> I have Mike Ward. Thanks for having me, guys. Mike, thank you so much for coming in. And before we start, you are like the godfather of our podcast, and we couldn't be more grateful. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. And I've like I told you guys off the air, I've listened to every episode. God love you. Thank yeah, you yeah. so much. And every time you guys say, okay, the season's over, I, I, I'm like, okay, but maybe the next season will start in like two weeks. Because you don't go like a, a full year without doing shows. So every week I'll tell my Alexa, I'm like, Alexa... And then she she never has. I'm like play standing by Terry and Ted podcast, and then it's an old episode, yeah, and I'm know. sad. I see. Well, God We're love you, Mike. Alexa yeah. Down. Yeah. We're letting Mike down. Yeah. Well, it was Mike Andor Pantelis yes. who said, as soon as your quote unquote retirement was announced, yes. there has to be a Terry and Ted yeah. podcast. Yeah. So did you listen uh, back in the day, Mike? Yeah, is yeah. that how you know uh, know of us? I used to listen to you guys uh, from Quebec City. Uh, really? There was a, a thing that people in Quebec City used to do. We'd uh, connect. I, I don't know if you can still do that, but you connect the cable yeah. to the radio, and then we'd get uh, t- s- channels from Montreal. So listen, to, I loved Shome and loved you guys. Was there no classic rock station in Quebec City, or did you just prefer Shome? Uh, just preferred Shome. There was, because uh, Quebec City, all the stations are French, so it's classic rock, but half of it is French. And classic rock in French is up and back, and then the rest, uh, I didn't know any of it. So, Yeah, yeah. and, and th- there's, there's also, especially back then, uh, not so much now, but there was a, there was a thing about Shome. Shome had yeah. like an air of... Uh, I don't know what I what it is I'm trying and to say. In those days, Shome wasn't classic rock. It was yeah. just rock. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, yeah. well, it was classic rock because we didn't know we were classic. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but a lot of the stuff that's now considered classic rock was new yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. it was just yeah. coming out, and Shome exactly. was on the cutting yeah, edge it, of it. Just, it had this air. There's a little bit there of There was mag- a mystique. Yeah, yeah, there was a yeah. mystique and a, mag- a magic about it in the, you know, the we've talked about it hundreds of times, the old mansion on Green Avenue. Yeah. I mean, it was the place where... Harmonium wandered in one night with, uh, you know, guitars, and there was actually a recording of Harmonium before there was a Harmonium album. Okay, which is really quite something when you think about it. That's that's a that's a special thing. There's magic there. Yeah, it was not unusual for whichever uh, band or or 
solo artist was in town playing and fit the show genre for them to stroll down uh, Green Avenue and into the studio yeah. and uh, say hi how are you Mike what's the um, what's the uh, the stat it's you are the host of the most listened to French podcast on the planet Yeah uh, Mike Ward Suzekut is uh, I don't know if it's the biggest all categories in the world but it's the biggest f- uh, French comedy podcast in the world We have about uh about two million downloads a month jesus yeah. christ it's insane and it started like when i started this in 2011 i was looking at my stats and the, the first week i was like okay i have 19 people that listen <laughs> but at, at first i got kind of uh i was like oh geez what am i doing but then i figured if i went to let's say in the old days the comedy works to do an open mic There'd be 10 people. Right. So I have twice go. as many yeah. people as <laughs> Doubled my course. audience, yeah. Then, like, after a month, I was like, oh, shit, I have 400 people. That's like the Jesus Theater. And then I was like, oh, I'm like the Saint-Denis. And then I... Now I'm like, hey, I'm I'm kind of like uh, Laval. <laughs> <laughs> Can you break it down by country, Mike? When you look at the it's, numbers, uh, yeah, it's almost it's ninety percent uh, Canada, which is probably like of the ninety percent, ninety nine percent in Quebec, and uh, a lot of um, in the ten percent, a lot of Switzerland and a lot of Belgium and a bit of France. Wow, yeah. you've been at, you've been at the forefront of so many things in the comedy world, and, I, and we'll get to them. But that you were way ahead of the curve on podcasts in 2011. Yeah. What, what, what led you there? Uh, no radio station wanted me. Like okay, the, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, I, I had a meeting with, uh, with uh, Radio Energie uh-huh. and with Sequoia to, yeah. s- to pitch the idea. Hey, it's just going to be conversations because Susie Kut is uh, uh, me and two other comics and we're just shooting the shit and right. just drinking beer. And I was like, it'll be a show. Uh, me and a couple of comics were just having a couple of drinks talking. And they were really nervous. They were, and now I, I told them, I was like, you, we can pre-tape it, and then you know, if if there's stuff you don't like, you cut it out. Right. But it seemed just too complicated for them. <laughs> and I pitched that in the early two thousands, and uh, they didn't want it. Then I I pitched it again to Music Plus because I was on Music Plus. They didn't want it. And then when uh, uh, Skype came around. I was like, I'll just do it myself. And then I, I did it myself. This was before uh, YouTube had let you do hour-long clips. So I had to put it on Vimeo. And then I had to explain to people how to listen to a podcast, which seems yeah. simple enough now. But in those days, I was like, okay, so you get the wow. RSS feed. And then I'd see people's eyes go blank. We, uh, we still get asked. Yeah, my, yeah, and my eyes still go blank when you yeah. say RSS yeah. feed. I've, I've heard of that yeah. before, but I, I don't even really know what it is. But How many I use times it. when you and I are walking around together and somebody will say, you know, are you guys back together? What are you doing? Da, da, da. And then we say, we're doing a podcast. And it's stunning how many people yeah. say, what's that? How do, how do I listen to yeah. that? Yeah, and and I they, think they know what it is. They just don't know where to go to yeah, find how do you, it. Yeah, you, like or I've how to had to I, it. we've I've had people ask us, "What time is it on?" Yeah, <laughs> you know, which is really, really, really strange. Yeah, you should answer when you get in your car. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, it starts. So nobody wanted you, nobody and wanted and that it. leads to the billboard story. What's yeah. the billboard story? Uh, the billboard story was uh, a couple of years ago when I hit uh, twenty five million downloads, and uh, the um, I've. Um, TVA has a, a podcasting network called Cube Radio, or Quebec has a Cube Radio, and they were doing tons of billboards. So I was like, I should get a billboard right in front of Quebec R and just write, <laughs> I can buy billboards too. <laughs> so it was just, I can buy billboards too, 25 million downloads. With your face on yeah, it? Yeah, with my nice. face on it. And see, we're, we're coming up on 100 million downloads. Jesus. We're going to hit it probably at the end of the summer. So I want to buy two billboards in front of CBC. So I want to have it in front. And even I'll probably buy like in front of Bell Media yeah. and just just everywhere. Just yeah. put my big stupid face everywhere. <laughs> is there a way to, like, what does that compare to? Like in terms of, you know, podcasts that people would know. Like is, um, it, is it as numbers as big as? Like how would that compare to Joe Rogan yeah. as uh, an example? It's, it's tiny compared to Joe Rogan, but it's the biggest podcast in Canada, wow. all, all languages combined. 
And it, I probably get about 10% of the numbers Rogan gets. Wow. I, I, maybe a little less. Yeah. But I, well, you're dealing with 10% of the audience, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I have way less people. Way yeah, less well, people. Canada's, Canada's population is 10% of America's, I yeah, believe. Yeah, and my, my podcast is in French, so it's one, yeah, there you go. one yeah. fifth of 10%. Like, yeah. we, we're, uh, you know, when the podcasts come out, like I said, the only, the only metric we have is YouTube, and I, uh, you know, I'll text him and say, hey, I think we're going to hit 1,000 this week. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and weird. we get very excited. Yeah, yeah. So now I'm uh, I'm pretty deflated, Mike. Yeah. Thanks what for I, what I like though about <laughs> podcasting is uh like you guys don't know the numbers yet for like uh uh Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, right. Spotify. But once you look at all of them and you add them all up, you get the real numbers. Whereas when you're working on radio, they used to give out the real numbers, but now they just give shares, like market yeah. shares. Yeah. So you're like, what do, What does that even mean? Yeah. Like you well, guys have a 30 share of, of what? Yeah. Of Ra how many people? Radio is hiding now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Radio is hiding because it's sliding. Yeah. Yeah. Like I saw in Quebec City, they still, uh, radio is still doing well over there. And they give the numbers. And even them, like the number one station in Quebec City is the French CBC. And they have per week, 200,000 people, Jesus. which is half of what Suze Kut has. Yeah. Yeah. So every, every show on Radio Canada is half of what I get. And my, they have 180 or 200 employees. We're like three people. I was going to ask you uh, if it's the same, if you have the same two guys with you all the time or if you have a roster. That it, you... It's always this, uh, the, for the guests, it's different every week. Yeah. Different every week. But I have the, the, the people that work backstage. The first two guys I hired, I remember when I put the, this out the first time uh, in 2011, I didn't even think it was going to be a thing. I'd, I'd, I'd asked friends, you want to record this? If it's good, I'll put it on the internet. If it's not, we'll just have, you know. You lost an afternoon. So we put it out. And the first two comments were a guy named Yann Thériault, who became uh, the director of my show, and a guy oh. named Jason Babin, a guy from New Brunswick, who uh, handles my social media now. Oh. So those were the first, the first episode. Like I was saying, there was like 14 people listening, and I hired, like, yeah, I hired two of them. Yeah, <laughs> almost 20% of them. Let's, uh, for people, you know, who might be tuning in, who, who are unfamiliar with your path, Mike, um, can you take us back to, you're growing up in Quebec City, you're listening to rock music, and you mentioned, you know, open night, Mike, at uh, one of the comedy clubs. Did it start in Quebec City, and no. what led you to stand-up? It uh, started in Montreal. I always knew I was going to do stand-up. I, I used to tell my friends when I was in high school, I'm going to be a stand-up comic. And I was really shy. Like, I was super shy. Really? So they were like, what the fuck? This guy's not going to be a comedian. <laughs> and then uh, I got into McGill... So I moved to Montreal to do McGill, but I was telling my friends, and one of the reasons why I wanted to go to McGill was because of the Comedy Works, because I knew of the... I'd never been to the Comedy Works, but I'd heard that name a lot. Right. So I was like... And in those days, like when, when they did the festival, um, the, they, they always had the, the best of the fest was always at the work. So I knew that guys like Seinfeld had played there and, you know, uh, Louis C.K., who wasn't known at the time, but they were the big comics were all there. So I told my friends... I'm going to move to Montreal, going to go to university, but at night I'll do comedy shows. So I moved to Montreal, went to university, and then every time I'd go back home, my friends would be like, hey, how's comedy? And I was like, I haven't started yet. And I'd make up excuses, and every week they'd hassle me. And then one time I went down to Quebec, and I figured I'll just tell them I'm doing comedy. They're not going to know. They're in <laughs> Quebec City. So they asked me, they were like, how's comedy? Have you started? I was like, yeah, no, I'm, it's going good. I'm doing, I'm doing shows. And they were like, where are you doing shows? And I was like, well, the Comedy Works has uh, open mics every Monday. So, and the, the, you're there a lot? Yeah, well, yeah, kind of, you know. And the, they're like, when's the next time you're up? And I was like, I don't know. And uh, Monday, and they're like, okay, we're going on Monday. <laughs> and I was like, oh, fuck. So this was a Saturday night in Quebec City, and this was way before the internet. So I went home, and in those days, if you dialed, if you were outside of the 514 area code, if you dial, dialed 514, I think it was 555-1212, you got the yeah. uh, 411. Yeah. So I, I got the Comedy Works number. I called up, to because I knew you had to leave your, your name on the answering machine to get on. So I called up, but there was someone there. They picked up, and I was like, I want to do the open mic on Monday. And they were like, yeah, but you, you have to call the answering machine. And I was like, I have like 10 friends coming. 
And the open mics didn't do that well. So they were like, oh, shit, this guy's got 10 people. You're on. <laughs> so they booked me. And wow. then the Monday, the Sunday, I wrote, out, I wrote jokes. I had some jokes, but I sort of wrote out a, a set list. Showed up early, told the MC. I was like, when you bring me up, tell him I'm a regular. So first time on stage, he said, this next guy, you know him, you love him. Here's Mike Ward. <laughs> Do you remember who the MC was? I think it was, I think it was uh, Mike Nemiroff. I remember Mike oh. Nemiroff was on the show, but I, th I think he was hosting. I'm not sure. And then I took, because I took after, Mike Nemiroff used to do a workshop. I took his workshop, so I'm not sure if I'm, you know when stuff's like yeah. 30 years old? Foggy. You're like, yeah. you remember stuff, and then you realize, okay, that's not how it happened. And so how did it go, and did your friends say, you're full of shit, that's the first time you've ever done no, that? No, it went really well, because yeah? it, it was, mo like, most of the joke. the first time it went really well, because it was all references that my friends got, because it was all <laughs> Anglo-Quebec City references. Okay. So I killed the first time, and then the next time, when there were no Quebec City people, I sucked a big <laughs> bag of dicks, because it was all, like, I don't, like, it, it just references that no one got or no one cared about. How long did it take you to get comfortable on stage? Because I've done stand-up on and off over the years, but I haven't done it regularly enough to get comfortable until just recently. Yeah. And I don't know what happened, but just recently, I guess I kind of said, fuck it. Yeah. You know, whatever a happens, hundred, happens. A hundred, a hundred percent comfortable took me about uh, 12 years of wow. doing it full time. Wow. But... Uh, Comfortable-ish. The people who wouldn't know me wouldn't know I wasn't comfortable. Uh, maybe a hundred, a hundred shows. I I love that story because you call the first of all. I remember that five 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 one two one two. Yeah, and it's it's kind of like sort of written in the stars, as some people would say, that a guy picks up the phone. Yeah. You know, that you didn't have to leave your name on the answer yeah. machine. I mean, it, it was was almost like it was meant to be. I think yeah. that's a really cool story. And I remember uh, something happened to me, like in the first hundred shows when I started. And I wasn't comfortable yet, but I was still getting good. Like the first maybe 25 shows, I was killing every other time. And I'd either kill or bomb. Like it wouldn't be. There's no in between. No in between. <laughs> so it was because I, I didn't know what I was doing. So it was just, it would go really well or it would just be horrible. And then after like 25 shows, then it started, you know, my bad shows were better. And uh, I did an um, open mic, and uh, Jeff Garland was there, the guy that plays Larry, Sand yeah. uh, Larry David's manager in Kirby Enthusiasm. And we started talking, and he had told me, he was like, look, the first 500 shows don't count. So just, wow. uh, you, you, you're, you're, you don't know your voice yet. Like, you don't know who you are on stage. You don't, like, the because I, I, always, I always like dirty comedy. I've always loved, like, when I was growing up, my favorite comics were guys like uh, Richard Pryor, Eddie Murphy, Sam Kennison, Andrew Dice Clay. And, uh, but I, so I was doing that type of comedy, but I looked like I was... 14 years old, like I, I weighed 130 pounds, I was tiny, I was this cute little boy, and I never addressed that, and then after, like, I, I don't know if it was him or someone told me, they were like, you should, because you, you show up, and people are like, oh, this guy's so, look at the little boy, he's gonna do comedy, <laughs> and then it was just like rape and murder, <laughs> and it was, but at first I didn't know what I was doing, but then when I figured it out, then it went well. It, the background of Quebec Mike, it's fascinating to me because are, are you being raised as a francophone? I was raised uh, both languages. Uh, my dad's uh, Anglo. My okay. mom was uh, was Franco. And uh, they, they had decided before me and my brother were born, they were, if we live somewhere French, they'll go to English school. Right. If we live somewhere English, they'll go to French school. Just to make sure right. both languages, you know, keep existing. And um, uh, so and uh, my mom, I only spoke in French with my mom, yeah. only spoke English with my dad. So I, when people ask me, what's your first language, I don't really have a have first one. language because I don't know who, if I said uh, uh, mama or dad. But as a, as a kid, you were drawn to English stand-ups. Yeah, yeah. I, right? I didn't even, because uh, in those days, uh, like, when, uh, like when the festival started, then there started being French comedy that was more present on TV. Right. But in before that, I was born in 73. So, like, all of my, until, like, 84, 85, I'd never seen French people do comedy. Right. But I'd watch, I'd stay up and watch The Tonight Show. And uh, so, it, like, I, I really, and that, when, uh, when I got into high school, you know, when you're in early high school, you like anything 
that's sort of wrong. Yeah. So I <laughs> loved yeah. like I loved uh, heavy metal. I yeah. loved comics that were dirty. When I found out about Lenny Bruce, like I found out like twenty years after, but I loved Lenny Bruce. Like I was obsessed by Lenny Bruce wow. as a kid. Terry and I were talking uh, before the show about uh, guys like yourself and Sugar Sammy and uh, Mike Patterson now who work both sides yeah. of the language divide. And we were trying to think of, uh, you know, 30 years ago, did those guys uh, or girls exist in comedy or did you guys start that? No, the, that, that, that wasn't a thing. Like, I remember no. the first guys I knew that did that were uh, Sylvain Larocque and yep. uh, um, Maxime Martin, Max Martin. When I first met Max Martin, he was, he was from Winnipeg. And he didn't call himself Maxime Martin. He was Max Martin. So I, d I didn't even know he spoke French. I thought he was just some guy from Manitoba. And then when I found out he was doing... He's one of the reasons why I got into stand-up in French. Because uh, when, when Just for Laughs started, the, there was French comedy, but it was character comedy. So it, they, it was almost like... Uh, I compared to Bumblebee Man from the, <laughs> from the Simpsons. Like, it was just <laughs> funny costumes and stupid yeah. catchphrases. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I hated it. And, uh, but I knew that Max was doing shows in French. And then I had asked, I was, I was embarrassed to ask Ma Max if that's what he did. But I asked one of his friends, I was like, does Max wear, like, funny suits when he's doing <laughs> French comedy? And he was like, no, he just does stand-up. And I was yeah. like, really? You can do just stand-up? And then I saw, I went to see a show, Sylvain Larocque was on. And he was just doing straight stand-up. So then I was like, okay, I'll start it. And I knew nothing about French comedy. But I knew there was a big uh, comedy show on Mondays in Quebec City called uh, Les Lunes Juste Pour Rire at the DAG. And since it was a Monday, I was sure it was an open mic. So I called my friends that had come up to Montreal to see me at the works. And I was like, I'm going to show up on Monday at the DAG, I'm going to do the open mic. So I show up early, and I tell the guy, I'm like, hey, I have uh, 10 friends coming. Uh, can I get a spot? And he's like, there, and the DAG used to fit, like every Monday there was 2,000 people Jesus, in the venue. Jesus he was Christ. like, you're bringing 10 people in a 2,000, who cares about yeah. 10 people? <laughs> so he was like, no, he goes, do a, like, like send an send a audition tape. And I was sure. like, I don't have an audition tape. He goes, well, film yourself in Montreal and send me what it looks like. So I, I go... I go see my friends that are all there, and I'm like, look, I'm not doing the show. And they're like, okay, let's just stay at the bar and hang out and watch the show. So I got, like, I was angry, and I was angry drinking, so I'm drinking. I don't, I don't use any drugs, but my friends were smoking weed, and I was like, fuck it, I'll, I'll smoke a joint. So I f smoke a joint, drink, get drunk, and the headliner didn't show up. So the, the guy organizing the thing comes to see me, and he goes, hey, do uh, you still want a spot? And I, I did, but I was stoned and drunk out of my mind. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then he <laughs> saw that I wasn't there. So he was like, oh, fuck. Okay, listen, I'll be back. And then he went on stage and he told people, uh, the headliner didn't show up. So we're going to do a contest. Three people from the audience come up and the funniest person will win uh, $100. It was something like that. And uh, so he goes, does anyone want to come up? I raise my hand. He brings me up on stage. And uh, there was a girl and a guy that went up. The first girl went on, and she did jokes like, uh, like a, you know, like, um, like almost newfie jokes, you know, or right. old joke jokes. So she does an old joke joke, and he tells me, he goes, look, do your stand-up, but do three minutes max. I go on stage, I do three minutes, and it just destroys. It, 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 and you're drunk and high. I'm drunk and high. <laughs> I'm like, I, and I was backstage, it was a, uh, the band was playing after us. I threw up on the drum <laughs> before, <laughs> before I went on stage. So I go on stage, and then I do, I had in those days maybe five minutes of stand-up. I do the three minutes that I translated, and I look over, and the MC is like, keep going, keep going. So then I do the two other minutes I have. Then he goes, keep going, keep going. But I had nothing else. So Jesus. then I just, I just, I was loose since I was, I was shit faced. Yeah. So I just started improvising, did like, did maybe 15 minutes and it went really, really, really well. And then it got off stage. He paid me. And I remember like, this was the fir first time I'd ever been paid. Or I th I'd been paid once in English, but $10 in a hot dog. <laughs> but this was the first like $100 <laughs> in those days. I was like, I, I went home drunk and high, woke up my mom, showed her $100, and I was like, I make more than a prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> and now he gets drunk and high for every show. <laughs> <laughs> 
but it was funny because then I was like, and this is what I love about comedy. The first time you go up, often it goes well. And then the second and third and fourth, it doesn't, just to bring you back down to earth. So th- I went back to the, that place, the DAG, the week after, or two weeks after. And I didn't realize in French, it was always the same audience. So it was oh. always the same 2,000 people. So I showed up two weeks later, did the exact same jokes, and got nothing. Wow. It didn't work at all. So I got off stage, and the MC was like, look, write 15 minutes new material. As soon as you have 15 minutes new material, I'll bring you back. And then I went home and wrote. And I was doing French and English, and in those days, there was a, there was a weird almost competition on both sides. Yeah. That, that I, Whenever I, I do... I. I'd go do English shows. I felt like a French guy. When I do the French shows, I'd feel like an English guy. So I was like, I think I'm going to have to pick one for a while. And I decided to go with the French shows since it was there were more venues, there were more like better gigs. And the thing that sucks about show business in Canada is uh, they they treat Canadian performers like garbage. Yeah. So they don't they don't care about they don't care about you if you're Canadian until you make it in the states. So I was like I'll I'll hone my act in French and then in a couple of years I'll move to New York or LA or whatever and then just ended up uh, meeting a French girl and you know, staying but here. One of the things that I've always admired about the Quebec system, there's a Quebec star system. Oh, yeah. Big time. And it's, it's its own business and it has its own lifeblood. And, you know, you, I could say to a buddy of mine in Calgary, you know, there's this guy, you know, or this singer or whatever. And they're like, who's that? Yeah. And I've said, you know, like he or she can't walk down the street yeah. in Montreal, yeah. well, but you get to Cornwall, you know, or, yeah. or Toronto and they don't know. Is that, is that, does that apply to you, Mike? Like you can't go, you can't go anywhere in Quebec without getting recognized. Is it yeah. the same though outside of Quebec? Like no. if you're walking down the street in Toronto, does anyone go, "Hey, it's no, Mike Ward"? Like in uh, when I go to Toronto, I get a lot of. That's the guy that went to court. <laughs> <laughs> <That guy. laughs> yeah, there's that. I guess. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't that like makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, but like in, in, in Quebec, they yeah they lose their shit when we. But go, do yeah. you make most of your living in Quebec? Yeah, like yeah. Uh, before the pandemic it was uh i let's say 70 30 but since the pandemic now i haven't been anywhere yeah in in like uh i guess since 2000 early 20 and when outside quebec sorry Ter, okay. if you tour if you do st- stand up outside of quebec where do you go generally other places in canada or uh, do you the states europe where do you uh, go i i like uh, the last couple of, i used to like going to england like 10 years ago mm-hmm. i'd go to i'd spend about a month a year in England just because I liked the comics there. And the last couple of years we were going down to New York, New York and uh, L.A., but I haven't been to L.A. that much. But I like... I ne- I. I like Toronto, and I every time I go, I'm like, "Fuck, I should come back here like next month." Or and then I end up forgetting how much I like Toronto. And so, is your, is your catalog of English material and your catalog of French material entirely different? It's the same, same, same material. The only thing is now, since I haven't done English uh, since the pandemic, I have to. Yeah, I used to write my jokes, or I still do, but like the last show, some jokes I'll write in French, some jokes I'll, I'll write in English, then I'll try them out to make them work in both languages. And they're always the same exact joke, but it they go totally different places. This, I've been anxious to ask you this, is a perfect spot for me to do that. Is the rhythm different? There's a rhythm to stand-up comedy. Uh, is there a ryth- is the rhythm different in French? Than not it is really. In it used to be. It used to be, but I think because of guys like Sugar Sammy, like yeah. when you listen to Sugar Sammy in French and Sugar Sammy in English, it's the same thing. That's true. Or like a uh, Pantelis. Pantelis. Yeah. When you, you listen to him in French or English, it's the same thing. Uh, just some jokes. Some jokes uh, work better in one language right. or the other, and I find that. Uh, like when, if you think of a joke in French, or let's say I think of a joke in French, and then when I when I adapt it in English, I'll add some stuff to it, and then when I do it in French again, I'll add I'll add the stuff I added to it in English, and then I end up, you know, improving right. my jokes every. So I all my jokes are translations of myself. You must have Quebec specific material though that that you could only use in Quebec because people outside wouldn't get the references. Uh, a little like in the new show, I have um, about a, a five minute bit about all of my friends that were uh, caught in the Me Too movement because the something happened that was really weird when the Me Too hit in uh, in Quebec. Everyone that that got canceled 
were, they were all people I worked with. <laughs> so it was so it was just insane. I was like, everyone I know is a sexual predator. <laughs> so I wrote a bit about that. So, <laughs> but I think the bit will work in English. Right. But I, they they won't get the, they won't recognize I, the names. I won't, uh, either I won't say the names. Yeah. And I used to not uh, do the do those jokes. But I saw Sugar Sammy once. I think it was in a a festival in Sudbury, or maybe maybe it was on TV. I, I think, no, it was when he was doing his Comedy Now special on TV, he was doing a bit about his his aunt, or, and a very, like, Montreal reference in front of people from Ontario. No one got the reference, but he explained it, and then they got it. Right. And then when I saw him, I was like, fuck, Sugar Sammy can talk about his aunt that I've never met, and I think it's funny. I think I could do that, too. Yeah. And then I, I tested it out. I was doing shows in L.A., and I did a bit about uh, JoJo. Remember JoJo? Yes, Psyche JoJo Savard, sure, yeah. JoJo Savard, yeah. and it, it, it went really well. And I was like, fuck, if I can make Americans wow. laugh about JoJo Savard, yeah. you can translate. Well, you know what? Everything. That's not just being a good comedian. That's being a good communicator. Yeah. yeah. You know, or so that's being very lazy. And going, <laughs> I like this joke a lot. <laughs> what was well, if it made them laugh, you were. Uh, I, I have no idea. I have no idea. This is like, See, yeah. Because yeah. it's a perfect target yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for uh, you. Yeah, she's a parody yeah. of herself. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, we uh, have to start thanking some of the sponsors here, Ted, as we continue our conversation with Mike. We, we should tell Mike about Voswin. And we should tell Mike yeah. about Voswin because yeah. it's hard to imagine. We have uh, an engineering and engineering consultant firm who called us okay. and said we want to advertise on your podcast we like, what, yeah. are you fucking kidding yeah. with us i guess he they think that the bridge builders and uh you know <laughs> people at nasa listen to uh standing by the terry and ted podcast but what they are voswin is they're a consulting firm more than anything if you have an invention uh, idea or if you uh, have an existing product or service uh, you're an innovator and you need to get to the next level and you're not sure how to get there because there's an engineering component uh, that you don't know how to tackle that's where Voswin comes in or they'll make it better yeah yeah as Terry says they'll take how does how do you say that yeah. what's that thing you say yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll take an idea out of your head and put it in your hands yeah they're yeah. like wizards they're yeah. engineering wizards they wear big pointy hats and robes yeah. and they do. Uh, yeah and they they bring your ideas they, they bring your ideas to life you can find them online at voswin.com and our thanks to Sean Smith the founder and president of Voswin, who thought it would be a good idea to advertise on this podcast. Another guy who's listened yep. from years gone by. And uh, thank you, Sean, for, uh, for uh, putting your faith in us. Mike, uh, Quebec is such a, a you know, soup of politics and cultures and everything else. And you, you walk both sides, as, as does Sugar Sammy. And I was uh, living in Calgary, and Sammy was doing the stampede. He was there for nine nights. And... Uh, he was at my house and we were sitting in the backyard and he said, tell me what you think of me doing a bilingual show. And my, my initial reaction was, oh, that you're nuts. Like that's, yeah. <laughs> that's not going to fly. And then the more we talked about it and he started to tell me some of the jokes he was thinking of using and I was on the floor and I thought, you know what? Even me, like a real tête carré, I understand the the references. I understand this could work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, he killed it. I think wasn't that a turning point? Yeah, because he, there there are he's a Bill One Hundred and One kid, and there's a whole swath of the population yeah. now that doesn't give a shit about what language yeah. you're speaking. They just they want they just they want the funny. Yeah, exactly. And do you think that 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 was a turning point? Or is there still a line there? No, that was definitely something changed with that. And That's after him, think. like yeah. all of the the newer comics that came after, yeah. are a lot of them are just you know they, if you ask them, are you a French comic or an English comic? They're like, I'm a comic. Yeah, right? yeah. and they'll do like, okay, the uh, Monday it's a choose uh, mo Monday it's a Tuesday show. <laughs> <laughs> Monday. I think he's drunk and high. <laughs> <laughs> but Monday, it's a French Tuesday, English. And uh, yeah, Sugar Sammy's so lucky that he... I was in Toronto when he was doing... He did uh, four, a show that was four languages. Jesus. And uh, 
That, but that you like you had to be Indian. Yeah, to I was going to say, what are the other two? Hindi knows, and Punjabi. Uh, Hindi and yeah. Punjabi. Yeah, yeah. That, I didn't yeah. like those jokes. I thought they were <laughs> they weren't <laughs> they weren't as well crafted. I thought, <laughs> but I think he was like like I didn't I didn't see the show. I saw him at the hotel, and he was t- told me he was doing that. So I figured that was you can't do like a. 10,000 seater. <laughs> yeah. Where is Sammy now? Does he still live in France or did he move back here? Well, he, he's got a place in France because he, he now can't walk the streets in yeah. Paris. Yeah. He's uh, one of the judges one of the from judges. Uh, yeah. France's yeah. Got Talent. He yeah. got yeah. the gig from when uh, Gilbert from the, the, the festival yeah. got, got caught for all those rapes. And uh, they, they kicked him out of uh, France's Got Talent. Yeah. And then Sugar Sammy was like, hey. Hey, I'll do it. I, I won't rape anyone. So he's got a place there. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, he used to be my neighbor. I know he was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mike, the, where does the, um, were you born with the, I don't give a fuck courage? Uh, or I, did that come later? I No, that, that, I was born with that. Because I think, like, I remember someone uh, telling me once, uh, I can't wait to be, like someone in showbiz, they were like, I can't wait to be rich and have the fuck you money. And I was like, yeah, but you need a fuck you mentality more than the fuck you money, right? Because if you do have the fuck you money, usually you'll be like, I'm not going to tell them to fuck off. I've, you know, I made eight million, but I want right. eight more. And yeah. I, I told uh, one guy I was working with on uh, at the radio, uh, Rouge FM, he had told me once he saw me, he was like, I like it. I like what you do. You're the only one. Uh, he, he goes, I couldn't do that. And I was like, you could do that, but everything has consequences. So if you did do that, you'd lose your job as a host of a big right. radio show. And then you'd become like a, a stupid sidekick that comes in <laughs> and then gets fired after a month and a half. But it, everything is choices. Because I'm in light of what we where I mean, you were even a, a leader and a forerunner in that with the court case. And I, I, I don't want to sort of, you know, retry and relive that. I do. Okay. <laughs> um, and and we, I, I guess we will, and I, and I suppose we should. But that, that was a precursor to where we are now. Like, I'm a massive Louis C.K. fan. Yeah. I think Louis C.K. is so talented, so funny. And I pay for his specials. I, you know, I go online. I give the five bucks. Yeah. I, I don't give a shit, to be honest with you. And I, I don't want to join that that the small minority of people who shout you down and try and cancel yeah. you. And that's what happened with you. Yeah, I got people I, tried to cancel you. Yeah, I did, and uh, but uh, I and I think that helped my my podcast because when uh, when uh, this was a joke I did in uh, a, a special that. I did the joke between 2010, 2012, and then 2013, uh, we get a call from the Human Rights Commission saying, look, uh, there's been a complaint about uh, about one of your jokes. And I thought it was just, the, like when my manager called me, he was like, yeah, the Human Rights Commission is looking into uh, in, into your comedy. And I was like, oh, tell them to go fuck themselves. Like they, they wanted me to send my material. And I was like, just tell them to buy this special. So <laughs> I, I hung up. And then I got a letter in the mail, um, 2000, I guess this was uh, 2014, um, a, a certified mail, uh, and it was uh, that I owed $82,000 for this joke. They said, the Human Rights Commission reviewed your joke, and uh, we decided you have to give $80,000. And I was like, this makes no sense. So I called, uh, I, I called around to figure out who the best free speech person was in Canada. Everyone told me it's Julius Gray. So I was like, okay, I met Julius Gray. And he told me, he goes, look, they're asking for 80000 uh, because it's a number that's scary, but it's a number that you figure you can settle. Like, they won't say, I, I want a million, because if someone says, give me a million, you'll be like, fuck yeah, I don't have a million. Yeah. Don't fuck yourself. But if they say 80,000, you'll be like, I don't have 80,000, but will you settle for 40? Yeah. And you'll try. So he goes, look, they, they're asking for 80 because they probably want 40. And as soon as he told me that, I was like, look, I'd rather give you 100 than give them five. Just, I didn't, it felt like they were bullying me into... You know, 
the changing exactly my comedy. What they were doing. So I was like, okay, let's let's go to court. And he told me, he goes, look, it's going to be long. I figured long meant a year, two years. And uh, the, we start uh, the first time we were in court is 2015 or 14, and I got the the Supreme Court verdict in 2021. Jesus Christ! Yeah. And tell me if I've got this right, Mike. My impression was. You were never making fun of Jeremy Gabriel or of his condition. You were no. making fun of a situation. Yeah. He was, because he was, um, when he came, and see, this is a type of joke that doesn't translate well, because in the French media, he was like uh, f- front page of Journal de Montréal every week and all of the Quebecois magazines. And he was this little kid that had lived his dream and sang for the Pope. But they made it look like he was a dying little yeah. kid. And the joke And he was, kept coming back. And he kept coming back. <laughs> and that was the whole joke. I was like, why isn't he dead yet? That was the joke. And then I, I did a rant about how... It turns out he was unkillable <laughs> and that I tried to, I met him, tried to murder him and he tried to drown him and he didn't die. And then the, but the funny thing is when you, when you read that joke, like the, the transcript, it, it, it's <laughs> like a lot of times I had, when CTV News talked about my court case, when the Supreme Court verdict came out, they said the comedian Mike Ward, who said he wanted, who said he tried to murder oh, Jeremy off. Gabriel. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, gee, these motherfuckers. Yeah. Like my brother in Calgary, all his friends, if they see CTV News, are like, your brother tried to murder a disabled Christ. boy? And you didn't <laughs> mock him. You were making no. fun of the situation. The situation yeah. was what was funny. Yeah. How did you manage the um, uproar, uh, Mike? Because there was, you know, there, there was, you know, it seems to me that there was quite an uproar. And Ted and I all, always say, Ted has specifically said, it's usually the loud, the, the minority who are yeah, the yeah. loudest. But there was a lot of people that said a lot of shitty things yeah, yeah. about and you. And a lot of people <laughs> that I like and respect. <laughs> yeah. That's the worst thing. When that, someone that you hate, you're like, go oh, fuck, you're yeah, an idiot. Yeah. But then when you see a journalist, so you're like, yeah. I like my, oh, fuck, okay. So how did you handle that? Did you ignore it all? Or uh, did- at first, the, the when it started, because uh, I'd been through a, a, a little scandal in the early 2000s. And the way I had dealt with that one, I had just moved away for like a year. So I just took shots shows in Europe and uh, I went to the States for a while and I, I so I did the same thing with this tour that I, I told uh, my manager Michelle I was like okay book me book me in Europe but the, I forgot with the internet like in 2015 whether you're in Germany or you're in Longueuil it's this like you get all the info so I was, uh, I, at first I was reading everything and everything made me angry and then I'd answer back to everyone and then i was like okay you just gotta let it go gotta yeah. let it go so i stopped i stopped uh, uh talking to journalists i stopped uh reading comments on social media I, and i i didn't do any interviews for a couple of years and then i'd, I'd read shit that like I, I even i stopped doing shows for like uh for uh, about two years i told uh, my manager and this is why i think that my podcast did so well I would, I'd just gotten a job on, um, on TV, and as soon as the, the story hit, uh, the, show, the show was the number one show was on Teletoon, on the, the French Teletoon. It was the number, number one show. We got twice the ratings what the second uh, number two show got, and they canceled us anyway. Because they were like, you know, bosses from Toronto. Yeah, they, they were, were like, running. Uh, everybody's running scared. When they came to, to see a taping, too, it was crazy because there were po- posters of me all over town and billboards. And every billboard had like a Hitler mustache <laughs> or s- swastikas. So, so I was like, oh, these people think I'm Hitler. <laughs> so I knew I was going to lose that. So I lost that. And I told my manager, I don't want to do shows. Because uh, I'd go on stage and people would yell the kid's name out. And it was just annoying. So I told him. I'll work a week a month. Book me whatever you want a week a month just so I can make money so I don't have to sell my house. And, uh, and, uh, and I'll do nothing else. So I, I quit doing TV, radio, stopped everything, stopped touring. And uh, I put all my energy into my podcast. And I was going through this weird depression. And I think that helped like people that the first couple of years were like, I've never seen someone going through like a mental breakdown drinking on cam and it, it was they were like it helped me 
It, a lot of people told me. Didn't you tell Joe Rogan like, that you dealt with it by getting into the bathtub and drinking vodka? Yeah, yeah I drank. <laughs> I used to spend about three hours a day in the bathtub. And I'd just drink. Like, even when I was ho- still hosting that show on Teletoon, I'd write in the bathtub. So I'd be, I'd be in the bathtub. I had a, like a, a board with my computer on it, and I'd just be drinking red wine <laughs> red in wine. the bathtub. And I, yeah, I was drinking vodka, red wine. That's I funny. drank like crazy. So where we're at now today, my, for I'm drinking less. See this, okay. <laughs> this, this <laughs> one's water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, first of all, when the Supreme Court decision came down. You you must have been elated. Yeah, you, you must have because uh, like uh, so so I got the first verdict that wasn't a real verdict, and then we went to court with the human uh, at the human rights tribunal, and Julius Gray told me he goes, look, you're going to lose this one because the human rights commission uh, is bringing you in front of the human rights tribunal, so it's the same people right. judging you. Right. So you're going to lose that, but we're probably going to lose. Uh, we're probably going to win the appeal, and then when we lost the appeal, he said, okay. Uh, we shouldn't have lost the appeal. Five years ago, we would have won the appeal, but now times are changing. And this is at what level? Uh, this was the provincial. This was the highest you could Superior go, Court? Uh, uh, Superior Court yeah. of Quebec. Yeah. And then he was like, the only thing we have left is the Supreme Court of Canada. And he goes, you, 10 years ago, you would have won for sure. But I was nervous because like now a bunch of things that were acceptable 10 years ago aren't anymore. And they're judging, they were judging this joke by today's standards and not by 2010 standards. So uh, when, when, when it came down to the verdict, and this was so weird too, because I didn't go to Ottawa uh, to be in front of the Supreme Court because this was when we weren't allowed uh, traveling. So I, I was in front of the Supreme Court on Zoom. So I was in my wearing pajama pants, seeing the, you know my future, like the, the like trying to. It was it was just bizarre. It was bizarre. Surreal. And then at first I was like, okay, whether I win or lose, you know, I I tried my best because I didn't want to be the guy that screwed it up for everyone else. And then, but the day or two days before the verdict, I was like, oh shit, if I do lose. I will have screwed it up for everyone else, and I developed a drinking problem, and you know, I I lost you know four or five hundred thousand. So I was I was really like not confident when pe- people were asking me. They were like, "I think you're gonna win." I was like, "I have no idea." And then we won five five to four, so it was very very close, very tight. So I I was just relieved. I wasn't happy. I wasn't. I didn't want to do any media. I didn't do any interviews. I just uh, um, we. Uh, uh, I think yeah, it was Poseidon that recorded me. I went to my studio at the Bordel Comedy Club and I recorded a French message and an English message. And I was like, look, this. I don't want to be this. You know, took ten years from my life. And when you look at me in 2015 or 2016, I look 30 years younger. Hmm. Yeah, like I look, it, it just, it's, it's... Took a toll. Yeah, it took a toll. And yeah. I didn't think it would. I was like, no, it's just, you know, it's a court yeah. case. But that, that's when after I realized, like guys, like when Lenny Bruce went through his thing, he ended up dying of a heroin overdose. And whenever people go to court for, for, for either comedy or any art form, they end up going crazy. And I was really nervous that I was going to go crazy. It, it's a really big deal. And I think, you know, the... I don't know if other comedians have told you this, but I think, you know, you went to battle for everybody else because I, none of us want to live in a world where you yeah. have to check and think about every th- yeah. single thing that you say. But I was I was so lucky at the time because I remember when I got the letter thinking, okay, I, I, when, when they said, okay, it's going to cost you 80000 I had enough money that I could hire right. Julius Gray. So, and most comics don't, don't have that yeah. chance. And even comics that are successful, if you've only been successful for a year or two, you don't have money p- set aside. Whereas I had a bit of money set aside, and I ran out, and then you know I yeah. ended up making more money. But yeah, I I gave to the campaign. It okay, was a, it was a it was it was an imp- I thought it was super 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 important, and I still think it is, and I th- I still think people will talk about this in years to come. Did it? make you it was one of the byproducts of it did it make you gun shy like today when you're writing a joke do you think no. oh fuck no but okay. it, it it just made me it uh no 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 i was really uh, and i knew it had either have like two effects on my writing either i'd i'd go way darker 
or I just become like the the most PC comic ever. Yeah. So I just started writing every day. I'd write a new bit, like a ten minute bit, and uh, just just to get it out of my system. And the the first six months, I was just writing about freedom of speech and why can't we say this? Why can't we say that? And then I was going dark, and then I was you know uh, I was sad, and then after like I don't know how many days of writing just garbage and it was garbage material if i read that now i'd probably shoot myself in the head but <laughs> I, I wrote a bit about baseball or some and then i was like okay this is just a regular bit that any comic could have written and then i felt good i was like okay it's i like become a poison out yeah i got a, i became a comic again because wow. i was worried there's a there's a comic in france called judani who um uh, he had a bit about uh, the Holocaust. He used to be uh, uh, he used to do a, a duo with a, with a Jewish guy, and he's a he's a I think he's a black Muslim. And they 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 had a bit, and he was he did a joke that people thought was uh, anti-Semitic, and um, it, so people were talking shit about him in the paper. And instead of uh, him like either apologizing, he was like, "No, fuck you," it wasn't anti-Semitic. And then he started just writing about how uh, Jewish people try to control him. And then he became, like, super anti-Semitic. Like, he became, like, he became a parody of himself. And wow. I remember the first couple of years, I was defending him. I was like, no, he's not an anti-Semite. Then I saw him, like, he was doing interviews in Iran saying that Israel oh, should... Christ. And then I was yeah, like, God damn. So I, I, I was afraid that I was going to become... You were like going to slide off. That, the, that I was yeah. just oh, that's a pretty good. That was probably a good cautionary tale yeah, for yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. And the 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 weird thing is when you're you're in a free free speech thing, and I saw that, like a lot of the uh, I think it's Sam Morell that used to have a joke. He was like the people that uh, defend free speech the most are comics and racists. So I'd always have, like, whenever there'd be a racist blogger, he'd be like, the people are judging Mike Ward. Mike Ward's not a bad person. I'd be like, see, this guy gets it. <laughs> and then I'd click on his thing. I'd go, oh, he does uh -oh. not like the Muslims. <laughs> oh so, so I was like, okay, I, I don't want to be, and I've never been political. Like, my comedy is zero political. And the free speech movement has become, for some weird reason, more of a right-wing thing than a left-wing thing. Yeah. And it should be for everyone, yeah. right? It used to be a left, like, it used to be the yes. right that, that censored people, yeah. and now it's more... A, so I didn't want to be, uh, like, uh, uh, like either a right-wing guy or a left-wing guy, because I, I don't even vote half right. the time. It, is it behind you now? Now it is. I really feel like it is. And see, this, I, I hadn't done, like... Uh, regular media interviews in a long long time and yesterday uh, yesterday was it no the day before i went to the just for last press conference and just to to go see what was up and yep. uh, uh, when journalists had asked me about it the the only thing i'd answer i'd be like that was that was 10 years ago yeah i mean get over it yeah so we've on next yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I don't mind talking about it, but it's just I I hate having to justify like Yeah, well Well you also don't want to be defined by it either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. unfortunately I in in French I'm not anymore, but in English I will be until I do something the you know spectacular or I murder someone. <laughs> if I if I murder someone, I'll be the, the, the you'll be murderer. Known, you'll be known for something else. Yeah, Mike. Within the comedy community, is there is there a divide between uh, the type of stuff that you do the, the the dark humor, funny is funny, anything goes, and and the woke crowd? Are there two camps? Uh, there are now. I'm really lucky because since I'm a little older and my thing happened before there were the two camps. So I see a lot of people now that are talking shit about other comics that defended me. And I know they only defended me because it happened in 2015. And if, if it happened now... They, they throw me under the bus. I wonder so. how that works in the green room. If, because I've heard of people, uh, maybe even Pantelis might have even told me a story about someone coming up to him and saying, another comic, you can't say that. Yeah. I just, I don't understand. Like, maybe it's because of my age, but I, I don't understand. Because comedy, I mean, it's the last place where you should be doing that. That's, yeah. you know... If you you what are you doing here if you don't like yeah. it? Why did you buy tickets to come? Well, here? not only that, if what are you doing on stage well, if you well, think that yeah. you but have to the, measure what yeah. you say? Yeah, yeah. I, the, I don't mind people that don't get comedy if they're just in a on the internet, yeah. but that if you're going to do stand up 
and you're telling another stand up, don't do that with yeah. that, that. Who are you? Yeah. And mind your own business. Yeah. And, and the, you know, and the other thing is if, if it really, if you hated what Louis CK did so much that don't go to the show. Yeah. You know, like yeah. if you can't separate the art from his, uh, I, I don't know what the word. I don't want to say foibles. Well, his yeah, his misdeeds, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. His misdeeds. and what Louis did wasn't like it's 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 just weird. Yeah, it's not because yeah. he did ask for permission. Well, like, it, and he did get consent, and he said everybody has a thing, and now you all know no what mine. mine yeah, yeah, his yes. album. You've heard his yeah, album, yeah. I assume, eh? Where yeah. he says, yeah. "I like to masturbate, and I don't like to be alone." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I, you know, and I thought this this guy. He, near, you know, he he was nearly ruined. Yeah, nearly and I love everything. how people though, when they talk shit about him, they go, "Cancel culture doesn't exist." He won a Grammy, but you're like, "Yeah, but he 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 lost everything." Yeah. else. and the only reason why he won a Grammy is because he self-produced his things. And every time he'd go to a club, the first year or two, yeah. there'd be people yeah. yelling shit. Yeah. You know how fucking hard that must be that you're on stage, and every time a woman steps up, stands up to go to the bathroom. You're like, oh fuck! Is she gonna yeah. call me a rapist? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's well, so good and so yeah. talented he, yeah, too. He's, he's do you so think good. he is he is he gonna bang his head for the rest of his career, or do you think that he can come all the way back? I think he can. He's. I. I don't think he'll ever be back the way he was. That he was everyone's hero for a while. Yeah. But he'll be. He, he like where he is now. He can still. Be way bigger than that. I think he can go to selling out the Bell Center. What when do you he comes think the Montreal. bigger picture is, though, for society? If the if that chill continues in this world of stand up, Mike, what does that mean for the bigger picture? I always like I'm a, I'm a, always an optimist, so I think it's it like I feel for comedy that the pendulum is is coming okay. back. Yeah. Like I really feel like there are some jokes that I do. That I know, like three, four years ago, they wouldn't have passed, and now they get it. Like I did, a, I was doing a benefit for uh, Yvon Deschamps, mm -hmm. who, uh, who's a uh, he's like the the biggest French. Uh, he's a, a legend, and uh, he's so nice, and his wife is so nice. And I opened with a joke about them. I was like, "They're such a cute couple that they they make me angry whenever I see them. I call my wife." And I just start yelling at her. And I'm like, you fucking bitch, why aren't you like Judy? And then she starts crying. And I'm like, Judy doesn't cry. Judy smiles. And all you do is tell me that I'm aggressive when I drink. And then, and then I, I, and that worked well. And then I was like, and Judy, I love, look, I, I'll tell you right now, I'm, I love Judy and she's younger than Yvonne. And I go, I'm just waiting for Yvonne to die. Uh, to die. I've, and when he does die, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, but I'm like, I respect their love. I'm not going to move in until he dies. But the day he dies, I'm going to the funeral and I'm just going to hug a little too long. And then, uh, and it, it, like, it, it, it killed. And yeah. I know, like, a couple of years ago, yeah. it would have been like, is he, is he saying he wants a comedy legend to, to die, die yeah. while the man is and sitting in front of him? It's even funnier because if, you know, you, I can close my eyes and picture Yvonne Deschamps sitting there. He's such a yeah. kind and He's genteel such a man. He's cute, sweet man. Yeah, yeah. Um, we need to uh, say uh, hi to the Mersons, Ted. Merson Automotive say on St. Jacques, just west of Cavendish, and online at mersonauto.com. How long have we been taking our oh, cars to Merson? Jeez. Yeah, I got to go see them next week. Nothing works. Yeah, you've, yeah, you've got a plethora yeah. of problems. It runs, but uh, that's yeah. that's about it. And the great thing about Merson is when I go there and they look at my car, they'll tell me exactly what I need done and nothing more. They're not going to give me the old, oh, boy, oh, boy, this is going to run you. They'll say you need this and you need that and you need the other thing. And down the road, uh, we were just looking at your tires. I would say maybe uh, another 10,000 kilometers on those. Uh, they'll be up front and honest with you. And that's how they've lasted for three generations, from Ben Merson to Mark Merson to now Kara Merson and her husband Celso. Merson Automotive have operated with honesty and integrity. And that's how you last, I think, in any business, but particularly in the uh, in the automotive game where there are a lot of people hanging around waiting to take yes, you sir. for a ride pun intended the mercens will not do that check them out uh, on saint jacques just west of cavendish and online at mercenauto.com mike i know all performers always have a little bit of insecurity but can you recall a point where you thought okay this is this is happening was it a paycheck was it a crowd 
Was it, you know, something that made you go, shit, I'm, I'm, I'm successful at this now? Uh, it took a long, like, to, the thing that really, uh, like, hit me hard was a couple of years ago, and all, all of my stories are about me getting censored by someone, <laughs> but I was doing, uh, there's, a, um, there's a, the Comedy Awards, Les Oliviers, and I was uh, nominated for something, and I, w- I was uh, presenting uh, an award, and I wrote something about the Human Rights Commission in the presentation. <laughs> and then the French CBC were like, you can't do this. You can't do this. Uh, you got to cut this joke out. And I was like, no, I'm doing that joke. And they were like, no, you, you, you have to change it. So I was like, I wrote on my Facebook, I'm not, I'm not presenting an award. I'm not, they, they, they don't want me to do the joke. Fuck them. And then they tried really hard to get me to come back. And I refused. And... Um, I ended up winning, uh, winning uh, the award I was nominated for, and all of the comics in the room they had they had showed up with uh, my poster at the time, the show that I, I got uh, the in trouble with. I had a, a red X on my mouth, wow. so they showed up with masks with uh, no a red shit. X That's be- amazing. because the wow. CBC had censored me. They refused to do any interviews with all media wow. so they walked in they didn't talk to anyone they had the masks on and then when i won the award they all went on stage with the masks and the red x and i was at home and i've i've won awards before and after and they mean nothing when i win a, a trophy i'm like oh this is nice but but this time i like i was seeing everyone on stage you weren't there at no the, no I, I was at home i was watching this at home and i was just Bawling my this, eyes out. Yeah, I was gonna, crying. Put a lump in my oh, yeah, yeah. I got goosebumps. And it's the, the like, like I, uh, yeah, it, I remember that day. Wow. Like it was yesterday. That, what, that, I was like, oh, fuck. Okay, yeah. I, through the whole controversy, wow. did everybody, all of your contemporaries and your peers have your back? Most of them. Most of them. What I, I, I thought was really nice, a lot of people that I didn't even know would write me and, and offer support. I had, uh, I had uh, Andrew Schultz, who's like... Sure, I know up. who you mean, yeah. But when, when I lost the appeal, he called me. I didn't even... He doesn't... He's not supposed to have my number. I don't know who gave him my <laughs> number. But he called me and he was like, hey, man... Uh, I, I saw you got a fine. You want me to help you pay? And I was like, no, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good, but thank you. Thanks for the offer. And I had uh, a bunch of, yeah, there's only a handful of people that uh, were uh, publicly against me, and, uh, but most of them were all very nice and very supportive. Has anyone come around who was against you and said, you know what, we were wrong? Yeah, a couple, like one guy told me in a green room this winter, he was like, I didn't get that you were, you, he was like, I thought you were just doing this for, for you to be allowed to do jokes about disabled people. And I was like, it wasn't, I wasn't defending the joke per se. I was defending the idea behind the joke. Like all jokes, you should be allowed to make fun of anything. Yep. You shouldn't have some, like, cause some things offend me that, yep. that aren't offensive to anyone else. And the other thing is, is and I, I learned this at a very, 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 very small level, if you're in the public eye, people are going to make fun of you. Yeah. And if you choose to go into the public eye, and I'm not talking about you or me, I'm talking about the kid. Yeah. If you're going to be on the front page of the journal all the time, you're in the public eye, and somebody might take... A poke at yeah. you. And again, Mike wasn't making fun no. of the kid or no, mocking the kid. It was no. the situation yeah. that no. was funny. And I thought it was beautifully crafted comedy yeah, as well. I, I think what happens a lot, though, is a lot of people just don't get it or well, they hear what they want yeah, to I mean, hear. Yeah. And in this day and age, people read like four sentences. Yeah, they're looking, yeah. And they're yeah. looking for oh, something to be uh, pissed uh, off. Yeah. And they point the finger. Yeah. That, like one thing that, that, you, that got me really angry at first was... Um, Right when, when the, the year I decided, okay, I'm not going to do shows in Quebec, I'll go elsewhere. I was doing a, a show, a series of shows in Edinburgh at the comedy festival, and the La Presse came to do an interview, and I didn't, I didn't, I told them I didn't want to talk to them, so they were like, we're just going to come um, see the show. They came to see the show, and the headline was uh, Mike Ward se met riche. Sur le dos de Jeremy Gabriel. Jesus so his Mike Ward Christ. is becoming rich off because the back. Uh, off the back. Yeah. I, and I was like, these motherfuckers. I'm playing Jesus in a Christ. small theater in Edinburgh. There's right. like it's a 200 seater, and tickets are like 15 euros. So, th- like, the, the I don't even think it's going to cover my expenses. Well, I was going to say your hotel and airfare yeah, is yeah. barely covered. So I was like, way. do these people not understand? 
like how business works. Yeah. Like how is this me becoming a millionaire if yeah. I'm if I'm not doing shows and the ones I'm doing are small shows? Well, it sounds to me like it was uh, vindictive. You yeah. wouldn't talk to them, so they thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll fix his fucking clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, did you, um, at some point in the last uh, 20 or so years, Mike, when you go on this journey and, and you start to garner some success and you start to make really good money, like really decent money, you know, when we're talking about, Ted and I were talking about comics in the car this morning and he said, you know, somebody wanted him to go to the East End for $20. Mm. <laughs> 25. Oh, 25, <laughs> excuse me. But, so you, I wouldn't have gone for 20, but when they said 25, I was in. You go to, you get to a point where, you know, you're doing well. And yeah. as we said earlier, there's a vedette system in Quebec. Is, is there one thing that you have or you bought where you thought, okay, I, I, I can do that now. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy that. You know, something, uh, something that when you were a kid you would have thought, I'll never have one of those. Yeah, well, uh, like I have, a, I, have a, I have too many houses right now. <laughs> and every house I have, I'm like, uh, 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 like I've, uh, my, my place in Florida, I always call it the place that comedy bought. Okay. And uh, the, I bought a house out in the country, and that's yeah. the house that podcasting bought. Okay. So, and I bought a house for my mother-in-law. That, okay. that was just me, you know. Yeah. The, I don't know why. That, that one doesn't have a name. Well, that doesn't sound like too many. No. <laughs> and, and plus my house. It's so a nice it's, number. Four is a good four number. Is a good number. Yeah. Four is Do reasonable. you have a house in Florida or a condo? No, it's a condo. Yeah. I call it a house. Yeah, so, like, yeah, yeah. I have, I have Where I is call. it? It's in Orlando. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't have a, a beach body. Okay. I have an Orlando <laughs> body. <laughs> you didn't want to go to Hollywood with the, the no. Quebec? <laughs> yeah. I like my neighborhood is British. Everyone's right? British. They're wow. all, they're, they're, yeah, I think I'm the only one with a non-British accent. <laughs> and yeah, I always call, see, my condo, I call it my house. And my, uh, I, call, I call my tour bus. We travel in a little uh, camper, okay. but it's my tour bus. It's your tour bus, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a, it, you look at it, it looks like I'm going to some, you know, carnival, but. Do you prefer, because you're, on, you're on French television so much, do you, do you prefer doing, te is television easier to do than a, than a live show like do you prefer that to a live no, show? no i i hate doing tv you now. do right? I, and i've always hated it but i used to do it because it was the way to get people to come see me right. live and i and i was i was one of the lucky ones that like in in quebec in french uh the big networks pay really well but in the old days it was music plus that paid nothing yeah. it was like the the french uh, mtv or yeah. much music they paid nothing but the, it was total liberty yeah and i remember we used to do a sketch comedy show there that uh i i had a sketch comedy show then i had sort of like a, a fake documentary they used to give us three thousand bucks an episode and they were like spend it how however you want just so we we were producing this stuff ourselves it was we were doing basically what the internet became right. on TV and total liberty and that uh, I didn't make money with that but I'd make money with my shows. Right. I, so I have always used TV to make to bring people to my show. What's the biggest crowd you've played for? Uh, I did a show in Gatineau in front of 70,000 people. Jesus Christ. Yeah. How do you even That's going to be an outdoor show yeah. cuz there ain't no, nowhere yeah, yeah, indoors no, yeah. in Gatineau. No, it, it was outdoors <laughs> wow. and it wasn't it wasn't fun cuz I mean you you can't hear yourself. Well, well yeah, and how yeah. do you like in a club where yeah. it's intimate you can work the crowd, yeah, right? No, and you're you looking work, them in yeah. the eye and yeah. it's got to be a totally different thing. I remember thing. though I did a thing that I'm really proud of cuz it was outside and there was uh it was uh, like it, a space where there was a lot of space and then uh at the end of where the people were there was like a big building and there was this guy i don't know what the security was he kept on seeing me i was just hosting so i'd bring someone up and he'd come see me and he was like this guy sucks this guy sucks i'm better than him and he was saying that through a fence he'd always yell at me i'm better than him i bring me up and then i was like oh this piece of shit so i told the organizers i was like i'm gonna bring him up i'm gonna bring him up so then there was an intermission i asked the follow spot guy i was like i'm gonna go on top of that building so when the show, music starts bring the follow spot up the top of the building, and I'll say, ladies and gentlemen, we have a guy in the audience that says he's funnier than everyone. Here he is. So I, I introduced the guy, went on stage, 
and he bombed and I figured I'll go down the down the stairs and then go through the crowd. In a regular show, this would take like maybe a minute. Yeah. But it took me like 17 minutes. <laughs> it took really, really long. And the guy just ended up leaving but before I got there. But I thought that was the funniest thing. Like it didn't work at all for the audience. But, but just for me. Up, though, eh? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's never he's very res- respectful now funny, when he yeah. goes to see comedy. So was he just a was he a comedian at all? Did he no, have no, any no. jokes? He was, he was just a loudmouth. Yeah, because he, yeah. yeah. he started doing impressions of people that died like eleven years ago. Christ. This is the thing. <laughs> this is the thing about what people don't understand. I I remember when you and I first started to host the Montreal show at the Just for Laughs Festival. I remember that was the first time I ever saw stand up comedy from behind the scenes and listen to the comics talk and watch them prepare and i remember going on stage and the spot hit my face and i thought holy shit you can see people looking at you like yeah okay make me laugh yeah come on make me fucking laugh yeah and And they judge you after every line and it's to me it was terrifying i still don't know how you guys do it but this is a it's a kind of uh uh i've lost my point I don't know what your point is, yeah. but I do know that not giving a shit is yeah. uh, that it's, helps a lot if you don't give a shit and if you don't it, take it personally. It, oh, I know what it was. It's such a craft, and people think, uh, Dave's funny at all the parties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He could do stand up. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not the same yeah. thing. No, no. Yeah. It's not even close to the same thing. And you are such a recognizable figure in, in, in the province. I would imagine people come up to you a lot oh, and yeah. try and be funny they a lot of people that uh, this is a thing i don't get whenever i'm doing interviews or on my podcast i always tell people how i write all my material and people send me they're like hey i i wrote some jokes i i can't I, i'm not a comedian but you'd be perfect for these <laughs> and they're all jokes that you're like okay these are just the most racist <laughs> The mean, stupid jokes. Yeah. And I'm like, is that what people think I do? No. The, uh, but no, yeah. No, people think, you know what it is, Mike? You make it look easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And well, the great ones yeah. always do. Yeah. You ever get any good jokes from them? Uh, no. <laughs> no? Yeah. I actually, I only read, I, like, uh, my manager never opens everything, uh, opens anything, but I always read the first line just right. to see. Sometimes I'm curious. We had one guy once send me a thing, and we called the police on him because they're like, "We think this guy has like he has so many pedophile jokes with references Shit. that no one should get except yeah. for a pedophile." So they might so, want to look yeah, in yeah. on him, and see like, what he's up to. Check this guy. Yeah, are you are you concerned at all after the after the Dave Chappelle thing or the Chris Rock thing? No, do you I, think about that? No, because I I travel like uh right now my tour I have uh, Eric preach. And I've Preach and I've uh, Pantelis had opened for me, so yeah. they're two giants. And yeah. I've Poseidon oh, on the uh, side. So how's he? He's done some stand up now, Poseidon, hasn't yeah, he? he how's it gone? Stand up, yeah. It's terrible, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but it's not. It's normal. Like the first, the first, the uh, the first five years are going to be hard. You know, but, I watch you guys on Two Drink Minimum, and I've said I've said this before. Uh, you guys, you and Pantelis, take the piss out of Poseidon <laughs> so much. Yeah. But it's like two older brothers taking the piss out of a little brother. But if anybody ever crossed him, you know that we'll Mike and Pantel is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I really, that's a, for people who don't know two drink minimum. Did you hear what Mike Ward said? He said he would murder somebody. <laughs> yeah, CTV News says yeah. murderer Mike Ward. Yeah, they're on their way over right now. Breaking uh, news. I'm going to quickly tell you, because I know we're running out of time. You're very generous, Mike. Thank you. With uh, uh, a quick word from my friends at the UPS store. Uh, the UPS Store Canada. These are stores that will help you if you run a small business, um, and they'll help you if you've got to get stuff to your uh, Auntie Matilda. Um, they can find you packing material. They can pack stuff for you. Um, they can get you labels. They can make sure the stuff is shipped. They'll tell you how to get a package to a small town in Canada and what it's going to cost you. If you run a small business and you got 15 things you got to ship, they can handle that too. There's over 350 
150 locations of the UPS store in the country, and each one of them is owned by an individual who understands what it is to run a small business. Yeah, I didn't know that. I you found that, that out because of uh, your podcast. Is that right? It, yeah. I just that's figured it was like, you know, one big company. No. No. That's the that's the thing because yeah. you're, you're dealing with a guy who gets it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? He's running He's his doing the same too. thing as you. Yeah. yeah. And that's uh, that's what I, I, I've been using them for years. I keep telling this story about when we moved, we... We left some stuff behind, and I took it to the store on St. John's Road, and the guy said, yeah, I can handle this. It'll be there in four days. That's the UPS store. That's what they do. Uh, the UPS store. Dot C-A. Dot C-A. When you went on the Joe Rogan experience uh, as, as the host of the most listened to comedy podcast uh, in the French world, was it still, holy shit, I'm going on the Joe Rogan podcast? Uh, yeah, it yeah. felt it felt like I, the way I picture comics in the 80s when they, they were booked on Johnny Carson. Okay. Yeah, I oh. remember. Cause, and there's something, like I even told him when I left. He's he's Oprah now. He's the man yeah. Oprah. He's the either the new Johnny Carson or the the male Oprah. What? How did that happen? Do you think? Uh, he was like I was on his radar for a while, and uh, he had told me he wanted to book me, and then uh, but it, it kept on just uh, not happening. And uh, we used to do a two drink minimum on a network called Compa Media in New York, and Rogan was in New York to do uh, Anthony Cumia show, and. Uh, Pantel saw pictures of our producer on a boat with Rogan. So Pantel has uh, texted uh, Keith, our producer. He was like, hey, uh, tell Rogan to book us. And then Keith was like, I can't do that. And then Pantel's just bullied him. He was like, listen, <laughs> I think he called him a fag. He was like, quit being a fag and get us, get us on Rogan. And then uh, Keith got us on Rogan. So it was just bullying. They, it, we always tell our kids, don't bully. <laughs> it's wrong, yeah. but you could get some Sometimes good you got to do what you got to yeah. do. Uh, I, as a guy yeah. who's got a massively popular podcast, what do you think it is that made Rogan so popular? Uh, just uh, the, the one, the work ethic. And plus, he's, uh, like, he's really well-informed on a lot of subjects. And he, like, uh, yeah, I think it's just he was, he was putting out a lot of content uh, that was different than than everyone else's content and interesting and they, they you can't get anywhere and if you do get like guests that you can get somewhere else like uh, I like seeing interviews with Elon Musk but if you if he's on like NBC he'll yeah. be on for two minutes right whereas Rogan yeah. it was like three hours right yeah and Rogan Sorry, Mike. Rogan also put on uh, uh, medical specialists during the pandemic who mm. the who the mainstream media wouldn't put on because right. they uh, they were contrary to the negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the sorry, the, the narrative. narrative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. I think I, it's yeah. just it's it's you know it's it's fascinating to me because it's it's um, it's almost inexplicable how yeah. some things just catch fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Rogan, I remember when he started his podcast. Uh, it, it like it, it took a long time for it to get big. Like at first, he started about the same time as Mark Maron. Mark Maron's podcast was huge. Yeah. It was it got big. Yeah. Really Mark Maron was before Rogan even, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. Wasn't well, he the first like, real big English language yeah, podcaster? He was. Uh, he was. Uh, like Rogan says that he started in two thousand nine, I think. But I remember when Susan Good started. Rogan, it wasn't even a podcast yet. It was just on Ustream. So he'd, he'd do live shows on Ustream. And uh, it wasn't a podcast, where, whereas Marin was like, a, it, it yeah. felt like real radio. Yeah. I remember that he's like, a, um, and the thing I've always liked about podcasts, well, the first time I heard Marin, his podcast, I was like, this is amazing. Like, I loved listening to interviews with comics. I listened to a bunch of them. And for TV, like, you can't write, uh, if you like uh, Oprah, you can't write Oprah and go, hey, I like what you're doing. I'd like to be on. Right. She's not going to get back to you. But I wrote Marin, and I was like, hey, I really like what you're doing. You're coming to Montreal. If ever you want a French comic on your podcast, I'd love to do it. And then he answered back, sure. And then when he came to Just for Laughs, this was, uh, I think, 2010, uh, he was doing a live w, uh, WTF in Montreal, and then Just for Laughs was pitching all the big names, and he was like, can I get Mike Ward? I'd like to wow. get Mike Ward on. So then they booked me on that, and I was like, the, uh, that, like just seeing this, the, the, how people were digging 
podcast, I was like, I think this this is going to become big. Like right now, it's just Mark Marin, but in a couple of years, there'll be more and more podcasts. And I right away, I was like, I got to start a podcast. And that's how we ended up here. Yeah, in yeah, this, in yeah. This studio in this <laughs> yeah. building. Nine years right. later, wow. you guys showed up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, does your family? Um, do you come from a family that? Uh, razzes you about your like? Do they keep you grounded, Mike? Do they? Do they? You know, the more famous you become, do they bug you about? No, your they don't. Uh, like, um, it's uh, like my dad. My dad has always been like. Now I think he knows I'm successful. But he used to whenever we'd go anywhere, and people would come up to me and uh, ask for an autograph or a picture, and the person would leave. He'd always ask me to be like. Who is that guy? <laughs> and then I'd be like, I don't know. And he goes, No, you must know him. He took the picture with you. He did, and he'd ask it, and he wasn't even kidding. He'd be like, yeah. Did you go to school with that guy? And I was like, He's twenty one. Like I'm, I'm forty eight. He's twenty one. I don't think I went to school with him. And uh, no, so but he's. I think he's proud, but he'll never tell me. Gotcha. Yeah, what he, does your dad do, Mike? Uh, he's uh, he's uh, retired, but he used to be he used to be a farmer. Okay. And he became, I think, the, one of the reasons why, too, I got into comedy. He used to work with, for Bell Canada and had a good job, and he hated his job. And he retired when he was, like, for, uh, early 40s because he had set a bit of money aside. And he was like, I've always wanted to have a little farm, so I'm just going to be, like, a gentleman farmer. Okay. And uh, he, he didn't, my, him and my mom didn't have kids yet, and uh, the doctor told him they couldn't have kids. As soon as he quit his job at Bell Canada, my, my mom got pregnant. Uh, with my brother and then pregnant with me. And uh, so he, like, we kind of screwed up his plans because he had enough money <laughs> for him and my mom. Right. But two kids is too expensive. Right. But he, every year, he'd, like, he, he'd have to sell a bit of land just to, you know, keep us afloat. But he kept on telling me, do what you like in life and mm. don't go for money. Like, he, and he always told me whenever I'd say, I want to do this when I'm older, he was like, do you really want to do that or do you want to do that? Because the person that does that has a nice car. So I just, I, be, I became a comic. And most comics, when you start doing comedy, you have parents that are like, ah, it's rough, you're not going to make money. My dad was like, you'll be fine. Good you for know? him. That's yeah. great. That's great yeah. advice. Yeah. How far back does your family go in Quebec City on the ward side? Uh, the ward side came here. My mom's side is Parra. The wards came here before the Parra. They, no shit, It was eh? the wow. first first generation of Irish. That mm. I don't know if that was like the early eighteen hundreds or uh, like it. Like they've been. The, yeah, yeah, that sounds about right because yeah. the yeah. birds came to New Brunswick in. Uh, in like 1810 or something okay. like i'm like ninth generation or something okay yeah friends of mine say you should have a special card that lets you cut lines wherever yeah. you go <laughs> coming through ninth generation <laughs> well yeah i would imagine you know for things like the olivier's or you're on television your parents are at home with a bowl of popcorn yeah watching, uh, yeah? yeah my dad it's funny though because i did a uh, a couple months ago um my dad used to be a big, a big, big Leonard Cohen fan. And uh, I was supposed to bring my dad to see Leonard Cohen the last time he was in Quebec City. And something came up, and I told my dad, I'll, we'll, we'll get him next time. And then uh, Leonard Cohen died, so there wasn't, there wasn't a next time. But I was doing this uh, TV show on the French uh, CBC, and I was singing Hallelujah, I the know, Leonard I'm, Cohen song. I'm so, so glad you brought this So I, I, I called my dad, and I was like... Uh, I'm, I'm gonna sing a song and it, it's my father's favorite song so i was like he's gonna be he's gonna lose his mind and then when i called them the next day my dad isn't good with emotions like he's the uh, like an old school guy that he like now he started hugging me but every time he hugs me he doesn't touch me too much because he <laughs> just he's, a little pat yeah he's yeah. afraid like he'll do a one two three like he's afraid that his friends will be like are you gay Arthur is. <laughs> so so like i come i was like did did you did you see it and he goes yeah yeah i saw yeah you were singing and i was like yeah and he goes yeah you you sang a song <laughs> i was like yeah 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 i saw that but not a hey good job or i no, just I a hey wow yeah because I'm going to be honest with you, we, we've made friends with Louise downstairs, okay. who, who's in the parking booth, and somehow your name came up, and she went, "Mon Dieu," <laughs> and she started to tell us about you singing. Okay, <laughs> and, and because we're two English guys, you know, we're we're doing our. What Ted likes to say when he speaks French, "C'était une catastrophe." Mon français, c'est une catastrophe. So we're like. Mike Ward, he, he shouted, you know, like we're trying to understand. 
And she's, she's telling us in French, oh, it was unbelievable, and I was, you know, crying, and it's just, un- it was amazing, and you've got to check it out. And, and I came upstairs, and I went on YouTube, and there you are singing. And A, I didn't know you could sing. And B, I think you were making the host cry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was yeah. like... Who was that, oh, Mike? Uh, it, th- <laughs> it was, because uh, that's a show, um, uh, that, that was my friend, Stéphane Fallu. Okay. And uh, that, that's, his, that's a song that gets him the most emotional. Yeah. And when he had told, he had told the producers, he was like, uh, Mike's never going to accept... To, to be on this show because I, I don't like doing TV anymore. But then since it was for my friend and it's a song, and then I, it's my dad's favorite song and it's a song that I've always sang at karaoke. So okay. I was like, because you, be you okay. nailed it. And that's, yes. you know, it's tough enough to get up in front of a group of people and talk yeah. to get up in front of a group of people and sing is burying yeah. your soul even but more. The, the musicians are so good. And I was nervous because it's on, it's live TV. So, yeah. but the musicians are so good because they, like when we did the rehearsal, they thought I was going to suck. So I started singing and then uh, people like uh, the cameramen were clapping. I was like, okay, I think okay, it's going it's good if, yeah. if cameramen are clapping. But right before it starts, I, I don't know when to start singing. So the guy next to me was like, he just goes, trois, quatre. And then <laughs> I start, and every time he'd, he'd tell me, okay, start singing again. So it was really easy. And they bring you, like, the, with the, there's five or six people doing the back vocals. So I knew if I, if I go off, they're just going to bring me back. So was it an invitation specifically to come sing? Yeah. And how did they know you could sing? And how did you know you could sing? They, uh, they, I knew I could sing yeah. uh, because I, I, uh, you know, when I go to karaoke, but I'm a, I'm a drunk singer, okay. and I, I uh. can't really sing. I, there's like maybe ten songs. I, I okay. sound good, and the rest it's you know hit or miss. But uh, um, they just want this is the type of show that they want friends, and uh, they don't really care if you can sing or not. This. You know, because I think what Louise was was telling us and why she was so surprised is, you know, I was thinking, you know, it's kind of like if somebody had said to me, hey, did you see Rickles sing Metallica? (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, because you're a comedian, you just, you don't make the connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when you sing and you knock it out of the park, you're like, oh my God. And the other thing that I love about uh, society in Quebec and specifically French media is they're not afraid to cry. Yeah. And somehow, as an English guy, I picked that up. I keep telling the story of Jeanette Renault and Celine Dion on the uh, plane. Oh, Abraham, that was amazing. Singing that yeah. unbelievably powerful uh, Quebec song written by, I always forget his name. And I, every time I watch Jean-Pierre it, Jean-Pierre Ferland. That's think, it, yeah. thank you. And every time I watch it, I cry. <laughs> yeah, 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 same. <laughs> and, and even... Ted was telling me French journalists when Guy Lafleur died. Yeah, you know they. I turned on the French uh, the French sports station on my yeah. way home after my morning show. Yeah. Uh, they do an extra hour, and uh, they were crying. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they, uh, French folks are not afraid yeah. to There's express emotion. There's something emotions. weird about holding back emotions that you think I'm being professional, yeah. but people at home listening, yeah. when you're crying, you want to hear someone else cry. Yeah, you don't want to hear, uh, hear some robot yeah, that and, doesn't care. Well, yeah. I think that my dad was like your dad. It's a very, and I don't know if you're Protestant. We're Protestant. It's yeah, a very yeah, Protestant yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Stuff those emotions yeah, down. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and if you can't stuff them down, pour liquor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> Mike, I, I, uh, I, I know you're such a busy guy. We can't keep you all day, but we could keep talking for hours. I know we could. Um, but I just don't know how to thank you for... Oh, this was so much fun. And I, I was really happy. And when uh, uh, T- uh, Ted reached out, I was actually listening to y- your podcast. Is that right? So it was very oh, weird. that's cool. Well, Serendipitous. Yeah. yeah and yeah. It's all, that, that's a huge compliment to us because, you know, you've become king of the podcast. And like I said, the godfather of this one, when Ted called me, he said, Mike Ward thinks we should do a podcast. So I was like, <laughs> what? Really? And we're at the facility that's... You know, at your invitation. So we're grateful for Merci that. Merci mille fois. All right. Thank you very much. Standing by the Terry and Ted podcast is sponsored by Jaguar Land Rover Laval, where the luxury is unmistakably British, but nobody wears a top hat or a monocle.